All right, how's everybody doing today? Uh, I I'm still working on that. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, no. Okay, so um, I'm going to do this a uh, little differently than uh, than we have been. I'm going to start with uh, um, a, uh, a kind of some sketching. So what we're going to start talking about uh, today, and this will continue for uh, quite a while, um, is uh, machine architecture and sort of some brief... Uh, a brief intro to that subject. Um, looks like we we only have six people on uh, Twitch. Man, you guys are gonna keep me from getting all that sweet ad revenue. Um, so anyway, um, so we'll um, uh, start talking about machine architectures. And so what I want to kind of do today is uh, give sort of a brief overview to the uh, uh, to the subject and uh, kind of talk about um, yeah broad strokes for everything and then we'll kind of dive into some of the details um, later all right so um, let I'm gonna sketch here a, a, a sort of real um, block kind of diagram of what a computer would look like so of course you have to have a processor and of course you have to have memory and then you might have other uh, devices like um, um, let's say like a hard drive or um, things like a video card or uh, things like that um, and then all of these things are connected together um, with uh, a thing called buses uh, and so buses are just our uh, paths data is transported along Okay, and um, so what we're going to basically talk about with uh, it in the architecture uh, department is this part of it. Okay, so um, we'll focus there on basically the CPU and the memory and uh, the specific stuff that happens there. Um, the the rest of it, of course, is all perfectly valid to talk about, um, but we're going to get kind of real low level and talk specifically about those two um, systems. Okay, um, so within those two systems, so let's kind of expand what the CPU and the memory uh, looks like. So we'll have the CPU over here and the memory over there. And the CPU is going to have sort of uh, several pieces to it. It's going to have a piece called an ALU. It's going to have control. It's going to have a thing called um, uh, and then a thing called registers. And then the memory is basically just a big array of um, things that can hold data in them. Okay. Um, so, uh, my buses are data paths that uh, uh, are 
paths that data gets transported along from one thing to another. Um, okay, so your memory uh, is basically just a gigantic grid of 8-bit cells. And uh, so each cell will hold 8 bits. And uh, then you're going to have however many of those um, that your memory has. So, for example, uh, you know, my laptop has 16 gigabytes of, of memory. Um, and that's uh, the power of two um, system. Uh, but other machines had, you know, much smaller amounts of memory. So, for example, the 8-bit um, Nintendo uh, could use um, uh, 64 kilobits uh, of memory. Um, and um, uh, so, you know, different... Uh, different machines had different uh, different amounts of, of memory. Um, so the memory that's going to be, uh, or what's in memory, well, it's all a bunch of stuff that we're going to, will be in hex. So you could have something like, um, data that, and I'm just making up numbers there, um, that, uh, is stuff that are in uh, in this uh, sorry let me back up the the data that's going to be in memory is um, is going to comprise multiple things it's going to be both user data meaning so like let's say for example you're typing a word document or something uh, then the data of whatever you're typing is going to be in memory um, but then it also would have uh, program data that are the instructions that the computer is executing um, in order to um, to do whatever it is that you want it to do. Okay, so these things are going to be connected by two buses. The data bus and also an address bus. Okay, so the data bus um, is exactly that. Data will move back and forth along it. And then the address bus will basically be how the CPU chooses which cell of memory to get data out of. It will send the address of that memory cell over the address bus. Okay, now in the CPU itself, the basic uh, three components, and we'll dive into more detail about each one of them, uh, you have the ALU, which ALU stands for um, Arithmetic and Logic. Okay, so basically, uh, if you wanted to add two numbers together, the circuit that does the addition would be part of the ALU circuit. Um, the control part of it is the most complicated and annoying to describe, but basically it um, um, decides or decodes instructions and controls other circuit, other components. Okay, and then the registers are temporary memory are used, uh, temporary memory cells used by the control and the ALU. Um, so, uh, now, what exactly the registers look like and what exactly the ALU looks like or the control um, is going to depend on what kind of uh, computer system you're working on. Uh, so, we'll look at a couple different examples today of uh, two very uh, common uh, computer systems that, uh, that you guys have all used and probably are using one of the two of them right now. Um, 
and then we'll look at sort of a, a simplified uh, uh, educational purpose processor that doesn't actually exist in real life um, in hardware, but, uh, but we can emulate it in software um, to kind of get the sense for how this works without getting too deep into the weeds. Um, okay, so the um, let's start uh, then by um, looking at some examples of what um, what machine code or how uh, instructions will get translated to the machine. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to um, close a bunch of windows that are in the way. Um, so I'm going to uh, switch over to a couple of windows and let me start with um, um, sorry for inception here. Let me start with Adam. Okay, so uh, let's take here this little snippet of code. All right, so I've written this in, in C, um, and uh, uh, rather than Python for basically technical reasons. Um, and the program does basically nothing of, of huge interest. It just defines two numbers, A and B, and I just picked two and three. And then it defines the number C to be the sum of A and B, and then this command is going to print the sum. So if we execute this program, all that you're going to see from the user's perspective is that it's going to print 5. Okay, and that's not particularly enlightening. Um, so let me uh, actually execute that program. And then you see, in fact, oh, sorry, it's uh, off the screen because of the webcam. Uh, let me scoot this over. There we go. Uh, so if I execute it, it does, in fact, print 5. Okay, fantastic. Um, and uh, so it's not a particularly exotic program in terms of uh, how it works, but uh, it's good enough for just to, to show um, what... Um, what the code, uh, how we get the code to actually run on the machine. All right, so I'm going to go back to the iPad for just a second. Um, and um, so the way that, um, if we come back here, um, since everything goes into memory uh, as basically a big string of ones and zeros, we need to have a way to take the code like I wrote in C that I showed you guys a minute ago, or in Python or Java or whatever language, and somehow that has to get translated from uh, the code uh, that I've written into all of this binary stuff. Okay, and so let's take uh, what I had. So, like, let's say that I had my code. Okay, so I had this, and then I had int main void, and then I said int a equals 2, int b equals 3, int c equals a plus b, and then print f um, Okay, so this was my high-level code. And in this case, I wrote it in C. And somehow, this is going to get translated into uh, the series of 
actual instructions for the machine, all the ones and zeros and stuff. Okay, so this happens, <clears throat> excuse me one second. Okay, sorry. Um, this happens in two stages. The first stage is that, um, oops, sorry. Uh, the first stage is that this code gets compiled. Okay, and so it gets compiled into what's called assembly code. And then an assembler takes that and produces machine code. Okay, um, so what we're going to look at is um, for, for now, uh, we're going to look at the machine code for this little pro or the assembly and the machine code for this simple little program that I wrote. Okay, so let me go back to um, inception mode. Okay, so back here in Atom, this was the uh, code that we were looking at. Okay, and um, what I did to run this, the first thing I have to do is I have to uh, compile it into uh, assembly, okay? So I do that, and here's what comes out. Okay, so this is actually the program that I wrote, um, but it's been assembled um, <clears throat> into... Um, uh, this kind of code, which looks really frighteningly uh, complicated, and, and it is. Um, but uh, you can see kind of some of the things that are going on. So, for example, these two lines here are loading 2 and 3 into memory somewhere. Um, and then... Um, we have, um, um, let's see, where is it? It would be right here. Oops, sorry, this, this line right here. This line right there is going to add two things together. All right, so the question is, what is this RBP, EAX, what are all of these things? Okay, those are uh, the registers. And... Uh, the registers uh, are different for um, different uh, processors, um, and uh, the this particular assembly code is <clears throat> um, written, or this is in Intel uh, language, so this is Intel x86-64. Um, and so that's what we get. And then each one of these instructions, line by line, corresponds to basically the machine code, which I'll show you what that looks like. All right, which looks like this. So... Um, the assembler takes the assembly code and then it's going to spit out all of this stuff. Now you'll notice that there's a lot of zeros in here, um, so this isn't very compact code, but all of these things mean something, right? So for example, um, let's look at this line here, 5F, 5F, 5445-5854. And then we also have some other commands here that uh, look very similar to that. And then there's some more of them down there. Okay, so uh, 5F, 5F, uh, these, notice that in our assembly code, we have several 
commands that are all the same. We get, see these uh, move L commands. Uh, we see a bunch of those, okay? And those happen to correspond to instructions that start 5F, 5F. Okay, now you'll notice that all the instructions here, some of them are longer than others, and what exactly that looks like depends on the processor architecture that you're working with. Okay, so let me show you now, I'm going to switch over to a different screen. Um, so, now I took this exact same C code, okay, and I also uh, compiled it for uh, ARCH64, which is the architecture of uh, like your iPhone processor uses this or uh, iPad. So basically most mobile devices are using ARM processors. Um, so uh, the ARM architecture is different. Um, and Mr. DeFrenza, no, absolutely not. Um, not yet anyway. Uh, we'll talk about what the specific commands mean um, later. Um, for two reasons. One, uh, modern architectures have thousands of commands, and it would be ridiculous to try and learn all of them. Um, the uh, So what we're going to do, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit later today, is um, look at an architecture that's sort of made up, basically for the sake of teaching, that has 12 instructions. That's it. Um, and by having a very, very small instruction set, it will be a lot more manageable for uh, kind of us to get our hands on how it works. Now, for those of you who are considering the CS major or minor, um, this, uh, this sort of unit that we're going to conclude the course with is really sort of a, uh, think of it as a, an introduction or a, um, to use a fancy French word, an amuse-bouche, uh, to um, uh, CS241, which is the architecture class. So there we basically dive in and do this for real processors and whatnot. But um, it, uh, for a modern instruction set, it's not worth trying to memorize all of the instructions you basically just are constantly looking at it in a reference. Um, and for that matter, most people never actually are going to be looking at assembly code unless you're in an architecture course or you really, really want to dig into that. Um, most of the time, you go from this high-level code directly to an executable with uh, your compiler, and you don't notice any of the stuff that happens in between, and you don't care because you just want your program to run. Okay, so uh, so what I did was I assembled this for the ARM architecture, and this is what we got. Okay, now, taking a look at it, some stuff looks kind of similar, some stuff not so much. Um... We have these, uh, these things called X's and W's, and then there's some stuff in brackets, and we've got LDRs going on, um, and an addition going on, and uh, other things like that. Um, so this, uh, this assembly came from exactly the same C code, but it looks very different because it's for a different architecture. Okay, so uh, high-level code, like C, looks the same on every architecture, or pretty much the same. Low-level code, assembly and uh, such, is going to be architecture-specific. All right, and then if we look at, for example, the st stack dump, so here's what this program looked like. Um, it's quite a bit longer. I'm not quite sure why it's so so freaking long. Um, but anyway, what we see, right, are a bunch of commands. Um, 
a bunch of uh, instructions and um, then what these instructions are going to be, some of it's going to be data uh, that's used by the program. Some of it is going to be um, the actual instructions that do the uh, do the operations uh, that we uh, like loading memory and, and stuff like that. Okay, so that all looks really horrible, um, and it is, but this is what it looks like on modern processors. So we're going to take a step back and basically go back to the 1970s, okay, and sort of look at a processor that would be eh, approximately of the level of technology uh, from a processor from, say, the late 60s to early 70s that you might find in, like, a, a calculator that you bought or something of those lines. Um, okay. Um, and so for that, we're going to go to Safari. And I'll post the links to this on Canvas. Okay, so here is our machine. It um, doesn't have a whole lot going on with it. Um, it has 256 bytes of memory. That's it. Okay. It also has 16 registers, and those are labeled in hex A through F. Um, and then it has two special registers called a program counter and an instruction register. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in an instruction here. Um, or I'm going to put in some things into memory. And these I happen to have memorized, but we'll talk about where where I'm getting this stuff from uh, later. Okay, so uh, I wanted to, um, well, actually, let me do, um, let me do that and then this, okay. So, um, so here's how uh, pretty much any machine executes uh, a program. So you have a bunch of data in memory, okay? And you can think of this as one big long line of ones and zeros. Then the program counter is going to be something that points at a location in memory. Okay, so where is the first piece of data that we need to load in to do something with? Well, it's right here in cell 00. Um, so what the program counter will do is it will count up and progressively the processor will move and load in new contents from memory and then do something with them. Okay, so the instruction register on this particular processor is 16 bits, okay, so that's uh, two memory cells worth, and on this particular architecture, every single instruction requires exactly two bytes uh, worth of memory, okay, so the very first four bits tell you what kind of operation it is, and then the other 12 bits tell you what you're doing uh, like the data that goes with that operation. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Okay, so the program counter initially is set to 0, 0, and so the very first thing that the program will load in is the contents of cell 0, 0. It then will load in the contents of cell 0, 1, and so I'm going to step this, and that means that 2, 0, and 0, 2 that entire instruction has been loaded into memory and is now sitting in the instruction register. Okay, once it's in the instruction register, we have to say, well, what does this operation do? Uh, and then we have to do it, 
Okay, so the decode part is going to be handled by the control logic that is going to activate some parts of the processor and deactivate others based on whatever this instruction is supposed to do. Okay, and what this instruction does is it's going to take the um, the number um, two and um, load it into uh, a register. Okay. Sorry, the audio just died for a second. Okay, so it's going to take uh, data and it's going to put it in one of these registers. So if I hit step, you'll see that the 0, 2 is now sitting in that register. Okay, so all that did was moved or copied really a piece of data from memory over into the CPU's register and I chose to put it in register 0. Um, I had 15 others I could have picked from, uh, but there we go. Okay, now the whole cycle starts over. Now my program counter is 2, so I'm going to look at the next um, uh, memory cell, or the next two of them, and I'm going to copy those in. So 2, 1, and 0, 3 get copied into my instruction register. And now I need to uh, decode that. Okay, and so what this is going to do is take the number 3 and put it in register 1. Okay, and there it is. And then increase the program counter, load in the next two bytes. My next instruction is 5201, and that is going to add the contents of two registers together and put the answer in register 2. And so the number 5 appears in register 2. And then the next instruction is 32FF, which is going to take whatever is in register 2, our answer, and it's going to store it out to memory. And so now you see my answer. I've changed the contents of that memory address down there at the bottom right, uh, and that is the, the answer. So that's kind of like printing, um, for lack of a better way of doing it. Uh, and then I load in the last instruction, which is C followed by all zeros. That's the halt command, and so execution terminates. Okay, so essentially, this is the program that I wrote a moment ago uh, in C for this particular processor architecture in machine code. All right, yes. Um, so 0xff, but you'll notice, actually, let me rerun this. Um, so notice, for example, here, 0x02, uh, that means the number 2. Now contrast that with here, where there's this star, OK? Um, so we have a difference between, um, uh, yeah, so we have a difference between a memory address and what is in that memory address, okay? So the, let's take this, uh, this 05 down there in the bottom right-hand corner. The value that's stored in that memory address is 05, okay? The address where it is stored is FF. Okay, so think of um, think of each of these memory cells like a little mailbox. So uh, in you know if you have a bunch of mailboxes, so like uh, imagine down in uh, the basement of uh, Sparks, you know, kind of across the hall from um, the bookstore, there's that big row of mailboxes, um, and each one has a number, and each one could have some stuff inside of it. And so knowing what the address is just tells you which box to look in, but you don't know necessarily what is in that box until you open it up and look, okay? Um, okay, so here's the, the sort of uh, question. 
how is it that I went from my C code, which let me move, uh, I'm going to do some cool split screen action here. Okay, so how did I go from this stuff on the left to this stuff on the right? Okay, um, I went through an intermediary, namely assembly. Okay, and so that's what we're going to start talking about for the next, um, you know, several weeks, basically, is the process of taking a procedure that you've written in Python or uh, even just pseudocode. Okay, so just a procedure that you've written out uh, in some high-level human readable language. How we translate that to assembly and then how we translate the assembly into machine code. Okay, so for this, I need to go to a website and let me get logged into this. Oops, 